Welcome, everybody. I guess we're about to uh, start off here. You are at the Office of Collecting and Design, uh, owned by Jessica Warwick, who we are so happy to be neighbors of. In fact, we first found out about this place through an article that was done here in Vegas, and we're like, we got to come to it. We came every day except for Wednesday when they were open to the public. So when we finally uh, showed up here, we fell in love with everything she was doing. And uh, not that long afterwards, we ended up opening up a bookstore right next door. So lucky for us, she has become a really good friend and we're excited to uh, host these events in her little spot here. This is called the Reading Room. So if you ever have a, a book you want to read, from our bookstore, uh, come on down and you can sit here in the, the chairs that they have that are not these chairs, but a very comfortable, intimate setting as well. Um, my name is Schwa Latart. I am a, uh, I'm, I'll be your host this evening. I'm also a writer. My wife, Sugar Latart, is the publisher of a lot of the local stuff that we do here. And we're so excited to be able to work with the talent that is in Las Vegas. Uh, we, there's so much amazing talent here that we can't even afford to publish everybody. So luckily there are other publishers in town and you'll be hearing from some of those writers as well tonight. In fact, the first one will, uh, will be coming up here soon. Before she gets on, I'm gonna do a little small piece. So tonight we're doing, uh, this is our second season. The first season, uh, we brought on talent and, and had them read. This season, we decided to give it themes. So each one of these coming up here in the next uh, month or so will have themes. Tonight is ups Outcast. Outcast. Sorry. I know. I know. <laughs> I have bifocal, so I never know which. I'm like, is that the right? Um, so tonight is Outcast. And... Uh, if you have family, maybe some of you know what uh, being an outcast is like. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I would, you know, I, I have a book called Effed Up Poetry for Effed Up People in Effed Up Times. My wife's the publisher, so she did Cat Fesh or Cat and Dog, so you get halfway through like a record, you flip it over and it's got a little bit of a different vibe. So uh, this is over 20 years of my poetry. If it weren't for my wife, Sugar, I would still have all these in journals and notebooks. Uh, she's the one who pushed me to put it all out. So uh, these are some, some old poems that I wrote when I was young and some when I was older. Uh, but this first one was when I was in my early 20s trying to figure out, you know, family and where I was from and, you know, who, who guided me to, through my journey. So it's called, The Family Tree Ain't Nothing But History. So what do I tell my mother? We could drink every night. Slow, cold forgiveness humbles long day fright. Drunken nights are doors into my daydreams. The only time I cry is in my sleep. Reality just ain't what it seems. My father was Jim Morrison and psilocybin. My mother was a Native American slave. In my last life, I was a pirate who went down with an ancient island. In this life, I'm a pilot who only comes down every other day. <laughs> Jesus was an alien placed into a virgin in the time of need. So, where's the beginning to the conspiracy? Broken car bones don't run anymore because slumbering burns off energy. So don't forget, every soul is electricity. <laughs> Along the back streets in the morning, families wait in cars to visit the prisoners in the stockade. You still believe the foolish things your parents say? Just because they believe in God and traditional holiday. How many orbits around the sun until the moth burns its wings? Solitude is the next plan of attack for a shrinking society. 
living at the edge of a much larger universe, dark is but a state of mind. We're all dinosaurs, laughed the monkey. I'll meet you at the sauna to burn off this week's impurities, forced daily detoxification with psychic terrorism beneath vitamin B. Medicines made by poison chemical companies. Brainwashed at birth, some stumble on to insight when there's nothing else to eat. Make tasty meals from dead animals of food signs. If cards are played to pass the time, then our then the hand we were dealt, then the hand you were dealt is not unlike mine. It could be worse, said a war-surviving nurse. Your father could have been an enemy soldier who raped your mother and murdered your brothers and taught you the true meaning of the word cancer. But in a hundred years, no one will care unless you build a multinational corporation. So drink your wine and spend the night with your best friend, your cat, or a caring neighbor. Because as you can see in these times, not even a rooted tree can last for forever. Thank you. So I'm really happy to bring up uh, Charlene, Charlene, who we met last night, and I couldn't be happier <laughs> to have her be a part of these <laughs> events that we're doing. Uh, Charlene Stegman, Moscow, please come on up. <laughs> Slide on over. <laughs> okay. Right get to the middle here. Okay. So we're talking about outcasts. And there are all sorts of outcasts. So I went through my stuff and picked out some outcasts, different kinds. This first one, well, children have secrets. And some children's secrets are rather dark, and if their parents really knew about them, well, these kids try and feign normalcy. It's called opposite seats. This is for the child who saw skeletons sitting opposite from her on plastic seats, blue or orange, or earlier still, wicker. When they rode when they rode to the beach, the subway rumbled through tunnels, and she thought of them all dead. She thought of herself dead. Fascinated by shadows cast on faces, how lips, noses were obscured, eyes darkened, how light moved from fluorescence, then into summer bright morning, and magically returned the person gave back flesh to bones. There was always the glimmer of fear that would grow larger than her heart if she thought too hard, if she concentrated on her own bones or that of her mother's, who sat next to her with towels, a blanket, peaches, plums, water in an oversized bag, unaware of the dark that inhabited the child, too. On the number 60 bus in winter, going to Central Park with her father, ice skates and mittened hands, she looked at the person sitting opposite from her and saw the flesh fall away. Where the nose was were two perpendicular holes. The face that wore oversized glasses became an anonymous skull. She thought about the infant, the boy held close to his mother, enveloped in her fur coat. If he were to die right then and there, perhaps suffocated, he would dissolve. Lost to the future without any bones to be found, the skeleton too fragile to withstand dirt and worms. His mother would no longer need a fur coat to keep him warm. Three. These visions, dark thoughts, were the child's secret. No one Absolutely no one knew the Stygian depths inside her. They would not know what to do about her. 
her nightmares given credence in the day as she rode the bus, the subway, laughed at the waves in Coney Island, happily held her father's hand as they skated in Central Park's Walman Rink on ice that she imagined is the same color white as bones. Oh. <laughs> and of course, we all know that the outcasts today are populating every major city, every small town. Mm -hmm. They are called homeless, or mm -hmm. to be politically correct, the unhomed. Crazy. Mm -hmm. I have been watching people who used to be somebody. They carry their delusions as a ghost passes through walls to rooms filled with cracked mirrors, beckoning them to take a tumble down the rabbit hole, skin the veneer of sanity until raw and oozing it scabs over and normalcy is left as a scar. See, the woman dressed for the apocalypse who carries her world in a garbage bag, coos and sings lullabies to the lost child fiercely protects the bits and pieces of soda cans, wool blankets, wire hangers, and her right to be the disease and the salvation. See, the man who sees strangers approach with machetes, baseball bats, AR-15s, who flails and curses at syringes loaded with anesthesia to remove the only friends who understand him whom he can confide in with cryptic gestures. See, the one whose sex has been obliterated, replaced by lice, rotted teeth, matted hair, pants soiled under the buttocks, booze, sour breath, and swollen limbs that leave behind open wounds dripping like the gash in Jesus' side. I invent simple fixes as I sit in my car, watching through rolled up windows, not much different from those who sit in glass walled spaces, their paper plans tattered at the edges, far from tents and shopping carts, away from the reek and the abandoned, who sit shaking, faded quilts over their heads. Perhaps in some metaphysical shift, they are in my movie to remind me when I propose logical answers, just how tenuous is my grip on what is real and what is crazy. and I had been singing <clears throat> and I had been singing where's the sunshine where's the sunshine to the right tune with the wrong words and I walked around the corner with some guy from then don't know who he was maybe Mike and there were my friends except for the one who counted the most eight of them four couples and they looked up at me as I came around the corner singing the wrong lyrics and I recognized them. <laughs> Realized they were ghosts except for the one whose birthday was yesterday. And they looked up and smiled in that I am so stoned, lazy way. And although I was singing my heart out and they were pleased to see me, I knew I was an adjunct, an add-on, interchangeable an amusement, someone who was someone else's other. And I couldn't join them. There were no more seats left. So I stood to the left of the cluster. I used to know them. And I woke up, still an outsider, still singing the wrong lyrics to the right tune, asking, where's the sunshine? Mm -hmm. It's amazing. 
Let's see. Da -da 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 -da. Am I doing okay time-wise, you guys? Okay. Ah, uh, this is for us. This is for the creatives. This is for the poets. This is for the writers. This is for the actors, the good ones, who <laughs> allow their vulnerability to come out. <clears throat> you know who they are. This is called Everyone Deserves Some Applause. It's difficult to tell those things aloud easier on paper, between the covers, slipped under the bed, never know who'll find them, doesn't matter. Now, here we are, confessing to a microphone, as our voices tumble words like stones in an acid wash, spewed from the throat, over the tongue, spit out between teeth, to become impossible vapors, heavy as iron meteorites thrown down like fallen angels, and the dug-out things with bloodied roots that screamed as they were pulled from the soil of our memories. Things we were taught to whisper, and here we are shouting them, heaving them from the car window as we pass the cemetery, as we pound on the locked doors of labyrinth dreams. No longer a mouth sewn shut with thread so thick and dark it had a warning label. Use only to bind wounds deep below the surface. Exposed now like a used up virgin in the spotlight. Our words accountable for the loss of anonymity. Bravo. Everyone deserves some of I got two more. That's okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All righty. This is a true one. This is actually real. <laughs> Not that the others weren't. But okay. <laughs> um, this is about people who are incarcerated. <laughs> for a variety of reasons. It's called Monster. I had a cousin several times removed and also by distance. Her name was Marjorie. She came to visit, was about my age, 12 or so. Maybe she was a bit older. She was a lump of a girl with orange hair, pale blue eyes, skin paper white. She ate french fries with malt vinegar. Was slow of thought and speech. That's all I remember about her. They said she murdered her children. I'm not sure about that. Overheard like birds who could mute their songs, whispered chirp for a fraction of a minute, then dismissed as you would a dirty secret hidden under the bed of a favorite aunt. There, but maybe not really. To this day, I don't know if it's true. Don't know with whom or why she had children, how many. Boys or girls, were they really young, just babies or toddlers, older? Were they orange-haired as well? Did their pale blue eyes open in disbelief? Did hers, as the knife came down, as the hands choked, as the water drowned? Did she know what she did if she did? Or am I only remembering snips of misconstrued conversation? There are some undercurrents that drift in and out of memory. Talk of asylums, the imperceptible shake of heads when her name or that of her mother's or her orange-haired family was mentioned. Eyes would close for a second or two, then the shoulder shrug that spoke of things too awful, monstrous secrets, things a loving family, no matter how distant, could not bear to contemplate. Marjorie, a witless criminal, a dumb animal, caged for life, her tainted blood a postscript for a side of the family where no more children were ever born. Oh, okay, last one. This is, what's this 
one of my early poems, and some of you might have heard this before. It's called Sweetie. The universal truth universally is we all grow old. Speaking of outcasts. Okay. The universal <laughs> you'll find out. The, uni <laughs> the universal truth universally is we all grow old or are supposed to. It isn't always pleasant. In fact, I think it never is. And those who say it is are lying through the few teeth they have left, yellowed like fine ivory, scaffolded in metal. We creak getting out of a chair or bed. We sit and stand accompanied by groans and small nonverbal protestations. We fart indiscriminately, <laughs> turn around to see who done it. But sweetie, the one thing we feel we never lose is our relevancy. And though our eyes are diminished, we can see clearly into yours. We see, sweetie, the condescending smile hiding the... Does she have any idea what we're talking about? We feel, though our fingers are often numb to turning pages, the turn back, the desire to not be touched, as if age were dust from a dead man that might rub off on you. Well, sweetie, just hope it does. Because let's face it, I am you, and someday, if you're lucky, you will be put on a pedestal in someone's memories. They will see you not in vibrant colors, but with the hues of age. They will remember the unsteady gait, the skin shaking loose from bone, the neck once long and lovely or sinewed and strong, now shrouded in flesh folds, lost lashes, and thin lips appear to criticize the world you inhabit. And then, sweetie, if you are really lucky, they will put all that aside and speak of who you were. They will remember to regard you as the progenitor of all they are now. And when at night they look into their mirror, they see you staring back. Thank you all. I have a book. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh my goodness. Um, obviously, I made a big mistake putting Charlene in the beginning because now we all have to follow up that. Your cinematic poetry is phenomenal. So, thank you. Uh, and now I'm going to hobble. I have to hobble yeah, someplace, right? Yes. Okay. You're good. You're good. Well, we got another more time for you. So. Okay. <laughs> Sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. Please. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Charlene's new book is going to be sold at Avon um, Pop Bookstore. She has her current one available. Her new one comes out, I believe, in a week. Am I correct? Yes. So we'll have it there. Um, although we just need to have a recording of all of them because I just want to hear her voice over and over reading. Mm -hmm. That was fantastic. All right. Uh, our next poet. Uh, and, and he may be even more tired than I am because we both performed last night at uh, a festival that was just down the road. And he was the curator and the manager and the producer and made it happen. And I'm so stoked to have him. Please, James Norman, everybody. <laughs> Whose books are also available at all. <laughs> it's all you James. Hey, folks, how's everybody doing tonight? Um, so I got a bunch of books, too many books, too many books I feel bad for the environment. Um, but there are a few of them there, and I'm going to read from some different places. This one's from my first book. I think I wrote this when I was like 26, so this will give you a start. And uh, I couldn't have been more suited for Outcast Night. And this one's called, And No One Will Be the Wiser. 
some days it was murder to wash dishes, but other days it wasn't so bad. You were alone at your sinks, and they didn't tell you how to do your job or how to give or to not give a shit, and you had plenty of time to think. A lot of times, I would think of people I had known who were doing good now, diplomas, spouses, neat little jobs, sometimes even a litter of goblins dancing around the hearth, postcard lives that, were, that didn't wear the nerves to threads or were enjoyable in their own way. They didn't have to work for minimum wage. They had Cadillac desks with rooms for family portraits and the headshots of former presidents. They had room for politics, especially after a glass of wine or two. Soft moments on soft sheets where they whispered to their partners secret longings of the past that were already too far behind them to catch their scent. They were safe from the bloodhounds, shark attacks, earthquakes and epidemics, cannibals on street corners, and all other forms of general madness. Then one of the cooks would poke his head from around the corner because he needed squid prep, or sauce milk, or desserts plated. I would think about the $7.50 an hour they were paying me, the walk-in closet where I slept, the shower with no curtain, the phone book next to the toilet for when we ran out of fast food napkins, the solitude of a 2 a.m. light rail car as it rumbles south through the downtown onto an empty sidewalk into an emptier apartment. Things that bring me back to the world when it slips through my fingers onto the page. And they might have success, clean sheets, the occasional miracle of contentment. But I have everything that's important packed in one bag. So, if someday the sharks grow wings, and the earthquake does come, and the bridges collapse, trapping them all in their glass palaces with their neighbors, postmen, and their priests, with wild dogs hot on the scent, baying and frothing as they draw so near you can smell their stink on the air. I won't wait for an invitation. I'll step back from my sink and hit the ground running, with a cigarette in my mouth and a beer tucked in my belt, and no one will be the wiser. <laughs> Okay, 12 years later, different uh, sub or same subject matter, different approach. This is about a human being that I love so much, uh, who's no longer with us, and I hope that love comes out in the poem. And it's called Ashoka, and if y'all don't know who that is, don't worry, because you're going to get the perfect explanation, courtesy of an old friend, Fred. Because of his medicine... He couldn't keep down the pizza we bought him, which brought on flashbacks of New York. Junk sick, chasing the high right back down into the low. For a long time, he drove a cab, and the guy he taught him says, Now, don't worry about the gas pedal. Thing weighs a couple tons. Just turn the wheel, and you'll get there by inertia. On a good nod, one can communicate with the monks directly. But what's the difference? Wait. On a good nod, one can communicate with the monks directly. Through the clear, though the clear light effaces itself, it's all this syrup of nothing. But what's the difference anyway between not knowing and not attaching? Just concentrate on the wheel. So I'm watching this mouth move, laughing, because he is a funny man, and humor is the soul of wisdom. He talks about guitars the way Bukowski talked about women, except not abusive. I wrap myself in circles trying to keep the gears wound so he can tell another story. Once, there was a king, and he was kind, but he was also bad, a real bad motherfucker. He couldn't get with the program, and he conquered all of India, all the warlords, because he was smart. He didn't change any of their laws. Didn't tell them who they could pray to. Didn't care. 
because he was smart. Sorry, I have like this ridiculous shadow. <laughs> because, mm. And he was a real bad motherfucker if you couldn't get with the program. And he conquered all of India, all the warlords, because he was smart. He didn't change any of their laws, said they could pray to whoever they wanted, as long as he got a little taste at the end of the harvest. But also, he always reinvested some of those taxes back into the territory so they'd be able to give him an even bigger taste next time around. Because he was patient. Then one day, he decides he wants to cross the ocean to conquer Ceylon. And he has his boys build him a couple thousand ships. Problem is, that's a lot of cargo. Whole army, food, supplies, horses, etc until one of his advisors questions whether that's even enough. Ships, you know. Couple, and he smiles, but then orders them to build a couple thousand more. No shitting, cause he was a bad motherfucker. I'm telling you. But then as he's waiting for the ships to get built, he meets this Buddhist monk at one of the markets, and he finds this cat interesting. So he asks him what's the score, and he says, nothing man, just be kind. That strength, goodwill, no expectation of a reward. What does a war win us anyway but another turn of the screw? And bango, that's it. He's converted on the spot, cancels the invasion, and starts building monasteries instead. Yes, sir. Ashoka brought the Buddha all across India. I ask him what the point is. And he says, you're missing it. That's the point. It's not something you can find and conquer, but if you open your eyes, it'll find you, wherever you are. Being awake is being humble, and if you haven't figured that out yet, you just don't know. That's all. We kept playing cards and drinking beer and talking, laughing, theorizing about the Dharma and how to hold a shovel. All the great problems, really. So later, when he had to excuse himself to hit the bathroom and puke, no one was embarrassed or sad. Life isn't a movie with a soundtrack. It's a card game that never ends where we pass the same five dollars in circles. Except in jail, he corrected. In the clink, you gotta respect your place in the food chain. We stayed long enough to lose track of time until the pauses were peering naturally in between stories. But he kept bringing us back to the cabs, the scores, all the cons he'd met in jail, a hundred old ladies and as many old guitars. We listened while his teeth shone like pearls snapped up again and again in the shell of a giant clam, tempting the diver in me, as I thought, one of these days, I'm gonna be patient like Ashoka. Though I know that day is not today, because I was listening to the story, all of them in fact, and I was pretty sure I'd suss the real riddle. If Ashoka never conquered India first, where would he have put all those monasteries? <laughs> Sorry, a little bit of a weird shadow keeps disorienting me. Um, this is called Nocturnal. This is uncollected right now. Wolf puppies do not smell the same as domesticated dogs. They have a stench that is almost sweet, like the way carrion conspires a crowd from vast distances. It got that way as the season progressed, as if we were producing a different set of pheromones. I finally lost it and shaved a Travis Bickle mohawk, like some inside joke that wasn't inside anything but my own head, percolating. I wore the same olive surplus jacket, never a shirt, right from bare-chested to jacket wide open as soon as the sun went down. Brubeck got more and more withdrawn, and even in his own mania, he seemed to recognize the scent of another man going feral and in comfortably close quarters, he kept giving me a wider and wider berth. For a week, we stopped talking entirely. Sometimes, when I felt inspired to reattach that lost appendage of speech, 
I would howl at the moon by myself on a towering pile of amendments, worm castings, chicken shit, lime. I'd howl and howl and smile at what discomfort I imagined it must have been causing him sitting alone in our shack, praying he was the crazier of the two of us. It felt like another joke until I realized I couldn't stop. That the door had opened into a violent wind. That it would no longer to be able to close shut tight enough to protect me from myself in this season of squalls. Besides, the howling soothed me. And even the moon stared back down like it understood the point I was trying to make. I thought beauty would save me. But it was the grisly stump of truth from which I picked sustenance off the bone. Without need for judgment, it was impossible to ignore it any longer, to dress it up as whatever else. No right metaphor could cool the flame. And the poets don't understand. Because they can't sing the song of the predator all alone. Not hunting, but simply existing unhunted. The thin note I am resonated through the curling landscapes just as my scent carried my arrival ten feet in front of me. I was lost. I was lost. It's the only way we find much of anything. I was lost, and I sang it to the world, and I stank and stalked like a life thing of beauty and brutality mixed into a canvas surplus jacket, a shadow of where I'd come from that only sprang alive at night. A lone wolf whose closest companion was the speechless chatter of the twinkling stars. I was the only thing left with a pulse for miles that wasn't afraid to give itself away, searching for others, hoping they were too far to heed my call, but still wanting them to hear it, as Brubeck shuddered and neither of us slept. Do I got time for one more short one? Yeah, sure. I'll throw it in. I done? Okay. This is from the next book to come out. And um, it doesn't have a title. I shot Shiva for a year and a half. Two rabbinical beards worth. I was so alone. Who was there to say the Kaddish with me? My Jewish friends worried. Bruce, Jan... The beard was to cover my face so I didn't scare them. Guess it didn't work. I found pictures from the first time I shaved it, and the naked face looked wasted, not ruddy from the sun, but irritated like a rash, ravaged by the tears that couldn't fall. I let it grow out again, realizing I wasn't done. I am a man, so I turned the pain inward, began wrecking the furniture, no one came to keen for me, to wail and rend their garments spasmodic. No one sang the Kaddish. I simply wrecked all the furniture until there were no chairs left. This poem is a mitzvah. Come sit with me a minute on this hard floor. Know that we cannot fall any farther than this. Finally, I've shaved the beard again. I've turned the mirror back around to see. There is room on my face for tears now. Let's try to make them tears of joy this time, to baptize each other in this river of healing, in the delta of human frailty where we gather. I'm a decent carpenter. I can build new chairs. Thank you. Yeah. James Norman, everybody. Let's come back. Let's like the war with you, Delta. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to take a little break right now, give you five to seven, eight minutes, and uh, let you have a drink, use the restroom, come on back after that, and uh, we'll give you another round. All right, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Thought that came out. So, once uh, my wife Sugar's ready. Uh, I'm going to hold off. I don't think you need to hear anything from me. I've got uh, Trad7 coming up here, and he was somebody we coerced, forced is too strong, I think, but um, <laughs> made sure we, we knew he was talented. We knew that they could do amazing work. We 
spoke with them on many occasions and Trent speaks poetry in just his communication. And so this is his second time performing with Avon Pop uh, Intimate Evening. And so please help me welcome up Brad Savage. <laughs> Happy Autumn Equinox, everybody. <laughs> yeah, this is um, my my favorite time of year for all the usual reasons, but also somehow it never fails every year during the fall. Like the biggest changes. I'm gonna center you before, yeah. you, before you make any changes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest changes <laughs> in my life always seem to happen in the fall. Um, it's, I don't know, it's just, it's a very transformative period, and um, this piece that I'm going to read tonight, uh, I kind of see me reading this here as like shedding the last few layers of this baggage that I've been carrying for a few months, uh, kind of like how, you know, the leaves fall and new beginnings, things end, things start. It's very symbiotic, but um, yeah, tonight I feel like this is just uh, the final sweep for me. Um, and this piece, uh, it focuses on um, a very toxic environment that I left uh, about two and a half, almost three months ago. Um, it wasn't a toxic relationship or anything romantic. It was a different kind of environment. But um, in keeping with the theme tonight, uh, this space that I was in made me feel like I was the outcast. And it wasn't until I left that space that I realized that that wasn't the case. And the outcast word is a two-way street. Um, it's, it's all about perspective. So. With the autumn equinox and change in the air and stuff, um, I feel really honored to uh, give oxygen to this piece tonight. Um, I haven't shared it with anyone. Um, but yeah, thank you all for being here. Bring fire into the story. Okay. This piece is called Epidermal Epidemic. In the belly of the valley grows a herd, the old clergyman said, of the dusky desert deerges that pushed these brutes into fear, spilling out across the gold-soaked hills. His dusty cassock hung with pride as he spoke, the little rosary cutting into his palm where some sliver of a man broke in ruby beads along the godly grip. I peered out from my perch at the dunes below, drinking the sky above me as the clergyman spun a weird song under his breath, clipped by the same sense of clarity that I washed my wounds in. There was talk in the town of an inverted flyer sweeping the valley at night, puncturing the people and the pastoral stock under the guise of heteronormality. The sameness kept them sane. This old friend quaked in his place, trembling underneath a bloaty skin, swollen and brimming with currencies he collected from the shadows. Through ticking teeth, he whispered, these filthy, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Looking out over the village and the valley unfolding before us, the sign having already sunk below the spoiled green, 
Those little sheep stood amongst themselves in quiet abandonment, waiting. Their blood is upon them, he added, quoting Leviticus and Jude. A fortnight since, the land was drenched by the kind of hypnotic terror that infects the feeble mind of cattle grazing among themselves. A winged waif swept the valley and joined the flock of babbits that shook with delicate, dainty aggression. He wore their robes, spoke their songs, slept by their bedrocks, and dutifully conducted himself in the presence of their bellwether shepherd, smiling behind its glittering, perfectly crooked canines. Simple and stoic as they were, these tender-footed hayseeds listened through abysmal earwax. They saw a wolf in sheep's clothing. They heard the ruffle of thunders at night. Drawn up on the walls hung the language of blind beasts that which snarls and squeaks with little rhyme or reason. Corralled together in white fluffy tufts, what do they say to strange skin? What do they hear at night? Resting comfortably in the stars, then black eyes cooked by the glare of their green horns, forever fixed on the imposter. Inside this cradle of construct, the herd quarantined themselves from all of the little pictures they painted of whatever lived beyond the gold-soaked hills. Stained glass windows of this kind kept the color outside while inside poured an eternal, buttery brook of sunshine, that blistering post-mortem break. The town crumbled in the wake of the creeper, whose eye shine revealed the nest of critters and contagion that burrowed beneath the enclave, of which the lot of them languished absently. The light from his eyes came from another place, sucked affectionately the joie de vivre of life itself, the beating heart of the human experience. Near the edge of town, where the Vespertilian folded pages of panic, the dates and names of criers, he unloaded a Vesper for himself that it might drive the virus from its root, out here where the garland separates the sensibility. Out there, where the rams, ewes, and woollybacks once obeyed the strike of their shepherd's staff, where beneath their coats little remained but flesh and bone, this one felt staked to the dirt, lassoed by a forsaken figure he didn't recognize. This mammoth spoke honey words to fallen sheep, the liquid gold flowing from the dryness of his mouth like a withered cave sparkling from the one. Suddenly, I'm startled by the gust of the clergyman who, now, seemingly stricken with terror and abstract fear, withdrew from the scene in the flash of an eye, leaving me alone to survey the pitiful valley below. Under the toasted eventide, the herd lay scattered and mangled across the cavities, guts strewn about like threads of rubies, the blood-soaked hills sunk into themselves, leaving pits and chambers to prickle against the decaying pasture. The mess before me twinkled under the starlight, and by morning, these discarded ponds would be washed by a lantern they knew, not themselves. Puzzled in place, my eyes began to see the herd mentality at work the hands weaving underbed tapestry, sewn with silver string. Poor dears, I thought, to be wrapped in shrouds of deceit, the cheat silently burning holes in their eyes. The herdsman braided his hair into the land only to trim away the lice that had gathered before. I lifted my feet above the rocks and broke out into the wispy nightfall, recounting the shepherd, the sheep, and my eternal fire.
So uh, after after Trad's first reading last season, everybody asked if he was a vampire. And I said, <laughs> I, I said, I do not know, but I've never seen Trad out during the day, and he's oh the God. best looking sixty-two year old I've ever met. So. <laughs> <laughs> have it in you? Yeah. yeah. Right, cool. Because um, this next boat came into our store and uh, was probably the most chill person we've ever met. And we thought, all right, are you going to be able to write poetry? And then we read their work. You're like, damn, you're really good. Um, so we're honored to have uh, Walker Rose come on up here and uh, tell some tales as well. Please, help us welcome Walker Rose. Hard to not be chill when you have two broken hands. <laughs> um, thanks for uh, giving me your spare attention after a long night of poetry. Um, I did opt for the podium, but it's not a manifesto, it's just poetry. It's not this serious. But, um, this first one is called Dead Enders. Most had come looking for a lot of quick money, having caught wind of what came to be known as the Green Rush, becoming masticated and spat out by hope, another face in the noon drunk crowd, the brainless organism of the weird and divided culture of those hills. The hills, of course, always came with legends of fortune. The pools were only such because they never made it out alive, because they only succeeded in losing everything, because eventually they're jailed by past freedoms with no one around to make sure they don't dope or drink themselves to the grave. Perhaps it took just the right type of fool to make it once in a while, one of these cases would stagger out onto the highway, gripped by dementia, but propelled forward by an instinct to live, a swaying phantom with unnatural eyes that glowed and shocked the homesteaders and highway commuters. Some went missing and there was nothing more to speculate. They hadn't hit it big. They hadn't hit at all. They wandered into a cold, dark night, an egoless death. Perhaps they are mad monks of the hills now, enlightened savages. From time to time, their stench and wild hair mistaken for Bigfoots. Still, others would just plainly fade away right in front of the bar, becoming ghost-like right in front of everyone but the majority just totaled their losses and packed it in, back to the city and more reliable industries. Some though, some would go on, some who were meant to carry on the wild power of such terrain, the lopsided weight of such times, coming out on the other side of it like nothing ever happened. <laughs> this is, you know, I'm just going to lump you in. We've lived a life um, where the term outcast was very closely intertwined with the word outlaw. And we grew a lot of black market cannabis, and that's what many of these poems are about here. You, know, you, you truly learn to feel what it's like to be 
little bit on the outside of society, living that type of isolated life. This one is called For Next to Nothing. We toss bottles out of the window and into the bed of the truck, where they live for a couple of weeks and roll around like clavicles on a ship long lost at sea. As we tuck close to the curbs on the road, a denial of dead men's claims, tossed off into the brush, thickets of shadow, unfound graves coursing through the veins of earth. In a land with beauty to spare where men obsess over money, always on a mission, he died on a mission, thrown overboard, lost at sea, now their bones make music to the rhythm of the trade currents, the weather below. There is a world right in front of us that we never really see. And the beer carcasses forever tumble over the sunken road, averted ideas, crushed efforts. Dogs scramble over tools and bottles and scraps of treated wood and ruined children's toys that will never be thrown away for some reason that no one will ever address. When we return, your wife will have food ready. These are special moments. She will shout into the hills for the girls and the dogs will come running. She will chase off any other woman who shows up with any amount of beauty or charm for next to nothing. This is a, a true story as well. The place I was born I never saw again, except on a Greyhound stopover on a bus ride to see our family out on the Rogue River. They turned us away ran us off like refugees crossing a line in the sand, regarded with a dangerous eye. We wanted to recognize our shared blood and that was all, but we were cast out into the golden dead fields of feather grass, surrounding a cemetery where they buried the ones who made it all possible without any choice, where we'd sit around and wait for the holes to fill their fallow hides. This one is cheekily, sarcastically titled, What Happens When You Have Everything You Need and No One to Share It With You. <laughs> My boots are old and cracked like a mummified tongue or a dried out cigar. My shirts are covered in holes and nutrient stains like a dog attack, like a Salvation Army reject. It is late in the fall, the colors have faded and I'm still here. Slowly go the shipwrecked mornings, the unlit days. I sing out loud, I piss anywhere. I leave little meals for the starving kittens what I have. I let the rain into my eyes, my mouth, my hair. I haven't seen another soul for six nights. I cut my hair into a pile in the mud, like a life delivered back to the earth, and tell myself that it's finally time to go. Knocking down the days. On the way back from town, I got drunk and rode on top of the car. I was always doing shit like that. Sometimes I'd get other people to climb up there with me. We felt free up there. Moving through the mercy of night, the live oak, the sea stench and fog blinds, down into valleys where the laws of man were and always had been unwelcome. 
As the dogs chased us around curves in the road, a pale phantom loosened into the air. We moved the way blood memorizes the valves of the heart without effort, without static. Most days you had to try not to think about it. We regarded our freedom the way a destitute man regards the prospect of sex with a sideways glance as a rumor, a meal one can't afford, a thing right in front of us, a cruel hologram of forever. There were endless ways of getting lost before your meal ticket ever arrived. For some, it was like chasing the setting sun into irreconcilable darkness. One day, news came that El Papucho was arrested in the South. A setup, he claimed, a stakeout. Our money hovering in limbo now. Was it ever ours? We had to wonder. It wasn't anything new. Freedom, like I said, it was a veiled mistress, an anchored dream, a cloud come to rest in the furrows of these mountains. But only a rookie ever let the future disturb the moment, we told ourselves. Even the moment wasn't a promise. A promise was a lie, and the moment was everything. Our eyes filled with sweat, our souls with hunger, our nights with the wilderness of the human dream. It was around that time that a man was found hanging from the porch of the general store in Whitethorn. An unnotable man, except for the word thief, carved into his head. He'd been caught trying to steal his freedom. Word around town was the Bulgarians had moved in for good. The Mungs were certainly rooted deep like anyone, their pros and cons were a package deal. They set up camp among the trees and left shits right in the middle of the footpaths for reasons no one could understand. But they were fastidious in their work and never asked for much and thus they thrived and continued to grow in numbers. Neither did they know when our freedom would come. Maybe with the next harvest, we all supposed, maybe the next generation. Some say you have to find freedom in every moment. I guess they've never floundered. I guess they've never found themselves hanging from the rafters of a general store in Whitethorn. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Sugar and Shaw, so much for having us on. Much love. Yeah. Walker Rose, everybody. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Walker's not only a poet, he's also an author. We have his book uh, at our store. And, uh, you know, I, I was 18 when the first cannabis law was trying to be passed in California to, for medical. And I was right there for it. It was one of the things that kind of saved my life. I thought it was a pretty amazing thing. And uh, I, I got to see a lot of the heartache in the beginning from medical patients to people trying to you know, change the law to people who didn't care. And uh, it was a long road. And it was tough. And it was illegal. And people went to jail for a long time. And there were heroes involved with all of it. And... It's, we've come to a place now that a lot of people forget about uh, how cannabis got to be legalized in a lot of states, and even though it's not legalized everywhere. California was a place that uh, really helped push it. And Walker's story, his novel, is phenomenal. He, he captures a lot of this stuff, along with his poetry, that nobody really talks about in the cannabis industry, and I think that it needs to be heard from the people who were there to help it get to where it is today. And so, uh, Ashman Walker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm, I'm a candid journalist, and I try and focus on people who've gotten into this, and nowadays nobody cares. It's a bunch of douchebags and suits and t-shirts that run the industry, and uh, I, I, I prefer not to be a part of it anymore. But what Walker has done, he's written a story that really takes you to the heartache and what it's like to be a part of the original growers and harvesters in Northern California. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I, can't, I can't say it enough. As somebody who helped fight to get the industry to where it is, I, I have yet to put it in such an elegant way as Walker has done. So anyways, um, uh, so before I close this all out here, we will be uh, opening up the bookstore so you can pick up some of these amazing uh, writers' works, or just hang out and have another drink over there. Uh, we, we need to get out of Jessica's hair. She's not used to being up this late, uh, so <laughs> we, we don't want to keep her up any longer than we have to. Um, but uh, coming up, we, we're doing themed events here. Uh, the next one will be October 15th. Obsessions, <clears throat> October 22nd, is the Invisible Ghosts. November 12th is Sensuality. And November 19th is Fear and Loathing. We'll be bringing in new poets and possibly some of the ones you've seen tonight. We'll see if they're if, if they have works in any of these categories. Hopefully, maybe. But um, again, my name is Schwa, my wife Sugar. We're the owners of All Pop Bookstore. We also publish, and we're so glad to have this amazing talent that we can help promote and be a part of here in Las Vegas. Jessica Org is, uh, we're so thankful that we get to take her space and uh, flood it like we do here. Um, so tonight was um, Outcast, so I'm going to go ahead and give you another family one because, uh, you know, if, if you have a family, you're, if, if you have a family and you're here, you're Probably an outcast from them. So uh, let's uh, let's see what I can pull out here. So I uh, I come from a long line of uh, people who have been here from the beginning. My 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 heritage is from the 1500s. My family has fought in just about every war against and for uh, the United States. Uh, I'm a Muscalero Apache Indian, but uh, I'm also <coughs> white, very white passing because I come from a long line of uh, beautiful women, uh, which at our family reunion we call rape uh, babies is what we are because our, our, our women in our life were very mean because they were left out on the farm while men went other places to work and, you know, they had a fight because at that time there were travelers that would come through. So all of our grandmothers and our great grandmothers and our aunts turned out to be assholes, but they were also they were also very beautiful women at the time. And so I have I have cousins and uncles named uh, Jose uh, that are albinos, and I have uh, cousins that are also black in their uh, lineage as well. So. This is a, a poem I, I wrote about all of that. We, we have a family reunion at the base of Arizona in a, in a place called Buckeye, which our family used to own for a long time. Uh, now it's a state park, kind of, on the Gila River. Gila River, I don't know who you talk to. Uh, and uh, you can go hunting out there now. They, the government allows us to have a family reunion once a year. And uh, it's a very unusual place, especially since half my family is Native American, mixed race, and the other half, uh, we're trying to assimilate. Uh, you know, it was tough. They didn't want to be considered diggers and, uh, you know, poor or trash at that time. Uneducated was a big thing. And so they wanted to be, you know, integrated into society. And... It's interesting to see our elders now, you know, those who wanted to stick with tradition and those who wanted to progress, if you will. So the title of this poem is called Mongrels. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm also like you, Norm, I need the light. So, <laughs> so the story goes, my great grandmother, an old Muscalero Indian woman, with long gray hair and a love for cactus, played with Geronimo when they were very young. 
There are many stories in my family that cover a plethora of adventures, close calls, and misfortunes. You see, I come from a long line of mixed race love affairs. The cultural melting pot that is the United States is my family potluck. Native American, Mexican, Native Mexican, American, African, American, South, Af South American, Asian American, Caucasian, half-breeds. Our, 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 our ethnicity being the lifestyle of love. A circumstance and habit stance, which you can determine, you can't, you can't determine this by first glance. My cousin Raymond joined the army and said there, everyone is just American. Nationally, I could accept that. And I guess being born, being born there makes me a Californian. But deep down, aren't we all just mixed breeds, collectively, simply earthlings? Also, have you noticed pure breeds always have the most disease? <laughs> <laughs> My mutt family has stories because our bloodline crosses the global boundaries. So, much like my ancestors, I roam the streets, driven by love for an adventurous earthling. Appreciate everybody coming out tonight. This was uh, the beginning of the, the season for us, and uh, we're, we couldn't be happier. Thanks to all the poets that came out. I mean, we really set the bar for the rest of us. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's hope you all can keep coming back and checking us out. Some of our poets that will be showing up are in the audience, and we're so happy to have them at our upcoming events. Like I said, we've got Obsessions, Invisible Ghosts, Sensuality, which will be adult only, of course. Uh, and fear and loathing. <laughs> Thank you all. Please, we'll be opening up the bookstore. Come on down if you want to check it out. Um, and uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.